basis lines, we're going to be starting peripheral lines, which is um, in the hands and in the lower arms. Um, as an LPN, it's not recommended that you start IVs in people's feet. That has to be an RN or a physician. So we're going to be starting peripheral IVs, which is in the hands, usually up to the mid arms. We, I, I don't go up above the uh, antecubital area. So, but if your patient cannot tolerate, or if they cannot get a peripheral line, or say that they are going to need long-term uh, antibiotics, or they're going to need medications that is too um, concentrated, or the um, the concentration of it is, is too much for a peripheral line, that they need a more centrally placed line in a bigger vessel, then these are uh, considerations. Uh, a portica is used when it is placed under the skin. It is, um, let's see, it's placed, it's like, and it feels like this. Imagine the end of this vial where it's got a metal ring and then a soft diaphragm in the middle. Uh, Portacath is implanted under the patient's skin and it can stay there for years if it's flushed properly. I know my father had one for his chemotherapy and that way there's not an open area to the skin if, and he used it for years for blood transfusions and different uh, things and a lot of patients have those but you can fill them under the skin. Most of them have just one, one area and you fill it from the outside and you can fill the little spongy uh, area where your needle would go and some of them have got at least double ports but for the most part it's a single one and it feels just like that under the skin. Now as an LPN you are not allowed to access those or put the needle into those. Only an RN can. You can infuse stuff into them. You can take out the needle but you cannot uh, access that port and for a porticath it requires a special kind of a needle. It requires a Huber needle, which looks like this. And again, if you're going to use these, these have got uh, a tubing attached to them and you have to flush it with saline because you don't want to put air into someone. But the special part of a Huber needle, and this is always one of my favorite things to do with access a port cath um, is that it's got, and it looks like a hummingbird. So if you imagine it, because here's your needle, I'm gonna show you. Now that's a big needle. You're gonna to have to look and see what, the nurse would look and see what size that they need. Because if you had an obese patient, you may need a needle that long. I mean, look at that. That's probably an inch and a half long. Some of them may be shorter if you've got someone whose uh, port is a little bit not as deep. But whenever you put that into the patient, now imagine this is under the skin. That needle, whoops, lays flush to the skin like that. Now this needle stays in place. That needle's always there. You don't leave a catheter in. That needle is there. And this part is to the outside. The Huber needle again is put in by the RN and it has to be put in with sterile technique. Sterile gloves, a sterile field, the whole nine yards and they put a big dressing on it. Now these needles have to be changed out every seven days. So you can't leave the needle accessed in them for 30 days the needle is changed out actually every seven days. But when someone is accessed, they have to be flushed usually every shift. Let's say the patient has got one of these and it's implanted in surgery um, by a surgeon. And um, if they're not in the hospital or have nothing going in them, they have to come into the doctor and get these flushed every 30 days to keep them open. And you always use the SASH method. And by SASH method, um, we used to use it on heparin locks or the intermediate locks because we used heparin in them. Um, now you don't use heparin as much as you used to, but with a portacath you do. Uh, it means saline, so you would flush it with saline, administer any medication that you're gonna give, saline again, and then you finish it off with heparin. And heparin has to be the last thing in the line because it keeps it from clotting off. It keeps a heparin up in the port that's under the skin, it keeps them from clotting off. So again, a Huber needle is used for the portacath. They're not used for anything else. The Huber needles are. Now, if you're doing the sub -Q, um, the subcutaneous IV fluids, like for the elderly, the needle looks a little similar to this. It's, it's much shorter because it goes in the fatty tissue, but it kind of lays flat against the patient's skin as well. So that's your Huber needle. I'm gonna put that in the sharps so I don't poke myself. 
Uh, the next uh, that the doctor may order is a pick line or a midline. These are good for patients that may have antibiotics and these can really stay in place six months, 12 months. Maybe they just need them for, um, for 12 weeks or six weeks. Because if you have the peripheral line, remember those have to be changed out every 72 hours. But if you've got a patient that has um, got maybe rocephin order for 12 weeks due to an infection of a wound, then it makes more sense to get a pick line. Uh, pick lines are inserted by specially trained RNs and they are inserted, inserted up into a bigger vessel right up above the anacubital space. And the needles, and I wish I had a better one, this is an old one. And this is um, where they put a needle in and then they thread the catheter through the needle and they remove the needle. The needle does not stay in place, but the catheter stays in place. And it's kind of tunneled. So the insertion site is way down here, but where it's gonna empty out into the bloodstream, it's going to be up into the, usually the SVC or the superior vena cava. Now, once the nurse or the specially trained RN gets that put in place, um, before you can use it, the patient has to have a chest x-ray performed because they've got to be sure that the end of the catheter is where it's supposed to be before you can infuse anything into it. And this is an example. Like you may only see this little bitty part hanging out, you know, up here. And usually they're, they're purple now, this is an old one. Usually they're purple or bright blue. You may only see this much hanging out and this much is threaded into the vascular system. Now this one has got a, and this again, this is old, look, it's not even needleless. But um, most of these have got pigtails on the end and they will have uh, different colors on the pigtails. They'll have a red one, a white one, and sometimes a blue one and they're color coded as to what uh, you can put in those. For the most part, if, if, a, if a central line or a pick line or a mid line, if it's got more than one pigtail and one of the pigtails has got a red cap on it, that's the line that you're allowed to draw blood out of. Not the other ones. That's the one you're allowed to draw blood out of. Now, some of the pick lines are called valved and not valved. And by that, it means it prevents backwashing. Because again, if you've got one of these, you have to use the sash method, meaning you have to end it with heparin, unless it is um, valved. And it has a, if it, let me see, no clamp. Nope, this one's got a clamp on it. If you're looking at the pick line and you see a roller clamp at the end of it, that means, and see this is an old one, that means that you will have to end it with heparin in order to keep it from clotting off. And heparin isn't created equal. You have to look and see the strength of the heparin that you're gonna put in it. Uh, if it is valved, that means there's no clamp on the end of it and it's got something built into it that, pre that prevents the blood from backwashing into it. And you do not use heparin with those. You can just flush those with saline to keep those patent. But again, those can stay in uh, for weeks at a time and it's a really good um, avenue for your patient. They require the blood, the dressing to be changed usually once or twice a week. You have to keep measure of how much is coming out of the patient and that's part of the documentation. And you also have to keep measurement of the arm. You want to be sure the arm's not getting a clot in it and they will have you measure the uh, bottom part um, of the patient's arm to be sure that there's not a clot in it. Your central line is one that's up, they're usually called subclavians or they go under the clavicle. Those are inserted by a surgeon or a physician. And those also can be left in place for a long time and uh, they require certain dressing changes and these also have to have x-rays and before you can put anything in them to be sure they're in the proper place um, now your next kind of catheter that you may see on a patient is a dialysis uh, shunt now most of the time you think of patients with dialysis where they've got the implanted shunts in their uh, arms or in their legs but before they implant those under the skin most of the time they will have a central line that's up in the subclavian area. 
that is for the, their dialysis only. And as a nurse, if it is designated as a dialysis catheter, you do not touch those. Only the dialysis clinic is allowed to touch those. You don't even do, make much eye contact with them. The dressings have to be changed by the dialysis staff. Uh, you can just chart that there's a dressing there, that there, if there's any bleeding there, and you alert someone. You do not flush these. These are strictly for the dialysis staff members. Uh, lesson learned the hard way. You don't change the dressing on them either because the dialysis nurses change those and you do not want to take the chance of messing up someone's dialysis. Now, once someone has been on dialysis for a while and they're uh, stable, they will insert and surgically insert a shunt under the skin. And in that case, your role as a nurse, of course, we're not gonna access those. That is strictly for the dialysis people. We mainly document that the, if there's a dressing on it, if there's any bleeding, but the two things you really have to document every shift, if someone's got a dialysis shunt under the skin, you have to palpate it and listen to it. You will palpate it for a thrill and it will vibrate. It's, it literally vibrates. And then you listen to it and you listen for a brewing, which is a blowing sound. If whenever your patient is there and you're doing your assessment, if one of these is missing, it's an emergency process. You need to let someone to know because that means it's clotted off. If you feel it and you don't feel that vibration, that means it's not working. So when they go to dialysis the next day, they're gonna have no way to pull the toxins off their body. If you listen to it and there is no swooshing sound and you don't hear the blood rushing through it, that is call the doctor right then because that's an emergency thing. Maybe they can go in, you can send them to the emergency room or the doctor can come in and um, do some blood thinners through it, or maybe, or maybe they have to do a whole nother shunt. Maybe they've got to put one of these back in. So again, brewing a thrill, that is nursing responsibility. You're not gonna have a brewing a thrill if it's in a sub, uh, if it's in a subclavian area. It just, it looks just like a central line, but it is designated strictly for dialysis. But if you've got an implanted shunt, and they're usually in the forearms, that's why I'm pointing to the arms. If you've got an implanted shunt under the skin, then you are gonna have a brewing a thrill. And again, it is your responsibility to chart that it's there or not. And if it's not there, it is not a, it's not there kind of deal. It's a call somebody, let your charge nurse know, let their uh, nephrologist know, because that's the only way that this patient is gonna be able to have the toxins pulled from their body. And that's it, now we're gonna start an IV.